Offices of Anxiety and uh, Interesting Day. Professor from Oxford, Amanda, will continue his lecture series today as well. Yes. Okay. Um, so, we went through the background of how we came to believe in the quark parton model and how QCD improves that to take into account the gluon radiation and is a proper field theory of what's going on. Um, and I'd said to you that the problem with parton distributions is that we cannot calculate them perturbatively, but once we know what they are at a low scale, QCD then tells us exactly what they are for all higher scales, right? <clears throat> Fine. So now, in this lecture, I was just going to outline to you how do we then actually determine them, right? How do we know what we've got? So, in fact, what you do right, is you have to parameterize them. You choose some low scale to begin your parameterization at, and you evolve them up. Now, here I've written a possible choices of the low scale from 1 to 7 GeV. <laughs> OK, it has to be high enough that you think that the value of alpha s at that value will you know, allow you to do perturbative work. Right? We used to have it around about 5, but it is true that people have tried going lower. They start the evolution lower, but they don't actually put any data in till a bit higher to be sure that that data is perturbatively described. But the variation in this starting scale is one of the uncertainties on this, one of the choices that people who do this make differently. And it can be a systematic difference between people. Um, <coughs> so let's say take a typical parameterization for the valence U, valence D, U bar, D bar, gluon. And you have an overriding x to the b1 minus x to the c kind of shape, right, to bind it at either ends. And then you just put some polynomials in after that. Now, these polynomials are typical. They were the original choice of what was once called the MRST collaboration. There are actually now many collaborations in the world that do this work. Historically, there used to be just two. There was the British team that was called MRST that worked from Durham, and there was the American team that called themselves CTEC. Right? Some of you may have heard of and come across these things. As we got to the onset of the LHC, actually, more groups jumped into this and started uh, producing partons. The neural net PDF began. There are also uh, others with name initials like ABM. And there's the one I was involved with myself, which is a PDF based purely on HERA data. So this is one choice that was originally chosen by MRST. But, and and CTEC began with this as well. And then CTEC decided to generalize it and put exponentials in there. So not to be outdone, uh, MRST, who went through various changes. They have made the mistake they called their PDF after the people in it. So it was Martin, Robert, Sterling, and Thorne. And the trouble is that, you know, first of all, Robert's retired, and, <laughs> then, and Sterling left the collaboration before his unfortunate death last year. And so it's called MMHT at the moment. But in fact, H, no, H is still there, but one of the M's has left. And you know what it's going to be in the future, we don't know. You have to keep track of this. But not to be outdone by CTEC's new choice, they decided instead of just a regular polynomial, they would do Chebyshev polynomials. And then some of the other groups said, well, no, we think Bernstein polynomials are a better way to go about this. The neural net people actually cut right through this and say, OK, let's not choose a parameterization at all. Let's let the, you know, let's learn the parameterization by using a neural net on the data, which is fine when you have big data samples, because you use half of your data sample to train the PDF and the other half to fit it, right? If you're trying to take into account experimental data that's only got a few data points, you can't do that. So none of these methods is perfect. But in telling you that there are all these different parameterizations, you might think that this meant that the PDFs were very, very different from each other. This isn't actually true in the end, because as you get the evolution going and you evolve to higher Q squared, the evolution of QCD itself takes over. And most of what you get is just 
perfectly predicted by QCD evolution. And where you began doesn't matter so much. Right. However, it does begin to matter at the percent sort of level, 1 to 5 percent, it matters where you began. Right? It doesn't matter to 30 percent, but it matters to a few percent. And that's really beginning to matter at the collider. We require information more accurately than that. OK, now, not all the parameters are independent. We determine the normalization of the gluon by using the momentum sum rule that the total momentum in everything must add up to 1. We determine the normalizations on the valence by using the number sum rules that there will be two valence quarks and one d quark, quark in the proton. And this is fine because the QCD evolution respects the sum rules. You can work that out for yourself if you, you know, go, go into the formalism in detail. These are some rules are preserved. OK, so that's how we begin. Then what do we do? Well, the measurable quantities I was telling you about yesterday, the structure functions that we get in neutrino, antineutrino, and charged lepton scattering on proton and deuteron targets, are then going to depend on that finite number of parameters, ballpark 15 to 20 parameters. But these structure functions are actually measured over a very wide range in the kinematic plane of x and q squared. And we have you know, more than 2,000 data points. So what you do is you take your initial parameterization and you evolve it using the DGLAP equations up to Q squared values where you've actually got data. And then you use the QCD formalism on the partons to get to the measurable structure functions. This is very simple at leading order, as I told you. This Something like F2 is just a simple weighted sum over quark distributions. It's more complicated but at NLO and well, next to leading order and next to next to leading order, but it's still completely calculable. And there are packages that will do this for you. You don't have to work it all out yourself. And you then fit your data, some 2,000 and odd data points, to these parameters. Now, the very fact that you can fit two to 3,000 data points on the basis of only 15 to 20 parameters is essentially the reason why we believe that QCD works at all, why we believe that it is the theory of the strong interaction, because this works. Right? So it established QCD as the theory of the strong interaction, and it provided us with some of the first measurements of the strong coupling constant itself as one of the parameters that you feed into the fit. I t gave you the PDF parameters on the previous slide. You can also free the value of alpha s and determine that in the same fit. Okay, now let's look then, therefore, where is this you know, recap from yesterday? Where is the information coming from then? The measurable structure functions on lepton proton are this weighted sum over quarks. If it's lepton on an isoscalar target, it's this sum. For the neutrinos, the F2 is a more simple sum over all the types of quarks and antiquarks. And the XF3 structure function is the difference thereof. So just from that alone, and this is where we began in the old days with this kind of information, right? you essentially have four equations right? from which you can determine, as we all know, four unknowns in principle. Right? So what will those unknowns be? Let's choose u, d, u bar, and d bar and determine those. This is sort of how the game began. Now, in order to do this, do note that one has already made a few assumptions. You already have assumed that u in the proton is the same as d in the neutron in order to set up these equations. Right? And you've assumed that in the C, Q equals Q bar for e each flavor, which is reasonable because gluons split to Q, Q bar flavor blind. Right? However, right, there can be deviations from these things because where you begin, you're in the non-perturbative region. There could be non-perturbative reasons why these things are not exactly equal. So we can't you know, believe QCD all the way. And there are a few more things we need. In these equations are the strange and the charm quarks. And we're only going for, for the u and the d quarks here. So you need further assumptions as to how the strange relates to the u and the d bar. This is a simple assumption that it's a kind of average of u and d divided by 2 because it's assumed to be suppressed. You also need to be able to deal with the heavy quarks, not just the charm here, but also the beauty. 
In fact, that's not really a problem at all because you can, because these quarks have heavier masses, you can actually use their mass as the scale of the process and you can calculate something like gluon to, Q, to CC bar and BB bar exactly in QCD. So you can calculate how much of a heavy quark you've got. What you can't deal with is how much of a light quark you've got because that's just you know, too non-perturbative. So some of these assumptions are in fact questionable. Note that in this, I've only written quarks. The gluon doesn't enter into this at the moment at all. The way it gets in is it enters through the evolution equations and it determines how fast things evolve. And it's from the rate of evolution that you get your information on the gluon in general. It's also true, I told you yesterday, that when you go beyond the leading order, one of the measurable structure functions, the longitudinal one, has a dependence on the gluon. And that information also feeds into all of this picture. So that's where we started, right? Then we have now more information because we went up to higher, much higher Q squared with the Hera Collider. Right? Now, this is a picture which is really the best illustration of electroweak unification you could ever have. Right? These are the cross sections for the neutral currents E minus and E plus P. See that they're completely the same at low Q squared as they would be. There's no difference in the photon propagator for E plus and E minus scattering. But as you get up to roughly the scale of the mass of the Z, mass of the W squared, you'll see these two blue curves deviating because E plus and E minus are then having both Z and photon exchange. And the gamma Z interference comes in and is different according to whether it's E plus or E minus charge. Right? And then you have in the red the charged currents where what's happening is you've got an electron going in, but it's a neutrino coming out. So it's a W that's being exchanged here. And we see what we kind of learn in school, or at least in undergraduate school, that the weak interactions are indeed, well, roughly three orders of magnitude weaker than the electromagnetic. But of course, the weak interaction isn't really weak. It only looks weak because the mass of the W is rather large. So by the time you get to the scale of those masses, you see it unifying in terms of size. And both of the, the charge current E plus P and E minus P becoming of comparable size to the neutral currents. Now, that's not only a beautiful illustration of electroweak unification, it also gives us more information. Because now in the neutral current processes, we don't just have a sum over quark and antiquark, F2 structure function and everything else zero. We have a non-zero XF3 structure function relating to the difference in the quark and antiquark. And I'm sorry, I can now see that I look at it, that the bars on my quarks here for antiquark have drifted upwards inexorably uh, in a kind of, uh, what, northwesterly direction, which uh, was not evident to me when I was looking at it last night. Anyway, it's Q plus Q bar and Q minus Q bar, right? And this one, the F2 one, we knew it before we had it before. It used to be by the weighted quark charges squared. That's still there, right, in this coefficient A. But it added to it are gamma Z interference terms and purely Z terms, where the PZ is giving you how the Z propagator gets into this and the electroweak unification angle. Right? And the new structure function that was 0 before, Q minus Q bar, is 0 at low Q squared, but it also has terms coming from gamma Z interference and ZZ. So, the F2 here is giving us the usual information, but we now get a new valence structure function from the Z exchange, which is you know, giving us more information about valence structure functions and without having to use heavy targetizer scalar targets where we may have to make assumptions. Right? So this is measurable from low to high X on a pure proton target. That's good news. And the other piece of good news is the charge current processes. I'm just showing the E minus P and E plus P cross sections here in bins of the scale Q squared against X. Each one of these right, 
So you'll see there's the pieces for the W propagator. And then there are the Q plus 1 minus Y squared Q bar or Q bar plus 1 minus Y squared Q terms. This is exactly like we had in neutrino scattering because it's kind of like doing neutrino scattering backwards, right? We used to do neutrino in and out went a muon or an electron. Now instead of that, we send in electron or positron and out comes a neutrino. So it has the same kind of handedness that the neutrinos had. But it now will pick, because we're on a proton and not an isoscalar target, it'll pick particular flavors out for the quark and the antiquark. This again gives us more information on flavor separation. In particular, this one, the E plus P cross section, gives you access to the down valence on a pure proton target. And actually, this is one of the least well known partons because. When you're doing it with, a, you know, with the photon, with electromagnetism, the photon couples to the charge. The U is always weighted by 4 ninths and the D only by 1 ninth. And that means that you just don't know the D so well. So historically, our information came from this assumption that D in the proton is the same as U in the neutron. Right? We don't have to do that anymore. From here, you can get what the D looks like directly from a proton target. OK, so what does it actually look like? Right? I don't want to go into too many details, so let's just have the bottom line here. Right? These are the cross sections, essentially proportional to the structure functions for the HERA data against the scale Q squared and at many different values of x. So you can see the Bjorken scaling at middling values. You can see the falling off of the partons at high x values and the rise at low x values. But also, if you look at the difference between the blue and the red, you can see the effect of electroweak effects coming in. That's why they're different. That's because of the gamma z interference coming in. Now, at least by eye, I think you would agree that that is very beautifully fit. The, the lines that go through this are the fits from QCD. They're not there just to guide your eye. They're real QCD fits. When I say QCD, I also, of course, the QED is all, also in there right, as part of it. And what comes out, what do parton distributions actually look like? This is one illustration. Right? So here we have the U and the D valence quarks. You can see that they are taking, you know, it looks here as if they're taking most of the momentum. They peak at around x of 0.2. You've got roughly double the amount of U as you have of D, just like your old prejudices, two U's and one D in the proton. Right? But you've also got a C here. This is the QQ bar C. And this is the gluon distribution determined by the fit. And note that each of these have been multiplied, weighted <laughs> down by a factor of 0.05. Right? That is just so we can show them on the same plot. And th the plot looks reasonable. Right? Because think about it, if I scale this up by 20, it goes right off the top of the plot. But note that that's true, because what it really means is that actually, for most of the range of x, the valence quarks are irrelevant. These two are so much bigger that it's really the C and the glue that count when you get to the collider. Right? Now, another thing to note on this, the uncertainties that I've put on it have been divided up into several classes. The red is the experimental uncertainty. That just means, what does the fit give me when I apply delta chi squared equals 1 to the errors to my fit? Fine. But this, is, this happens to be the HERA PDF that I'm showing here, right? And in that PDF, one of the things we did was we also varied some of the model assumptions. Now, what are the model assumptions? They're things like, what is that value of Q0 at which you start your evolution? We decided on 2, but we varied it down to 1.5, 2.5. How much difference does that make, right? You have to. To get, do this properly, you have to have a heavy quark scheme. You have to generate your heavy quarks. You have to choose the masses of those heavy quarks. This is not completely determined. If you go and look at the PDG values, you'll see there's an error on them. So you choose the central value and you vary it by its uncertainty to see what difference that makes, for example. Or another obvious one is that you. You decide at what Q squared you're going to start your fit. We have data at here, actually, 
way down to q squareds like 0.1 or so. I might show you some of that in the second lecture. We only fit QCD from Q squareds of about three and a half and above because it's from that kind of a Q squared that we trust the, the perturbative evolution to work. And there's an extra little, so sorry, that's the model uncertainty in yellow. The green is then parameterization uncertainty, right? That means not just believing the initial parameterization that you chose, but adding extra parameters to it to see whether the fit actually wants more freedom. And you do that until effectively your chi-squared just isn't getting any better anymore, right? And whether or not you do have some parameters is making the difference in the green shape, right? And the pink is from the fact that we included jets in these fits. I'll, I'll get to jets at the end of the lecture. And jets, of course, as they turn into hadrons, quark jets, there are assumptions about how they hadronize as well, and we also vary those. So um, this is just to say, you shouldn't just believe things that come straight off the shelf with the experimental error. You need to account for what your assumptions were that got you there. Now, as I said, the actually part on distribution functions are determined by several groups. So here, I've got U valence, D valence, glue, and C, and I've put on it the determinations from the HERA PDF, but also the lines from the MMHT, that's the update of the Durham group, the latest from CTEC, who now shortened their name to CT, and the neural net PDF there. And you can see on this plot, you know, they're looking fairly close, but they're certainly not identical, right? Now, actually, a better way to compare PDFs if what you're actually interested in is cross-section at, at the collider is to compare not the bare PDF, but what we call the part-on-part-on -part -on luminosities. And they're defined here. This is the QQ bar luminosity. It's essentially the part of any subparasis cross-section that depended upon the incoming partons. So there's parton one in here for the Q bar, parton for the Q, and then the other way around, because always you're getting this PP identical particle situation. A QQ bar could be this way around or the other way around. Well, my arms won't do that. but. Um, so you have the two terms from the Q and Q bar both ways around. Compute that integral and compare that rather than the bare PDF. Or for the gluon gluon luminosity, that's simpler because gluons are only you know, one way around. This is the definition of the luminosity. Now, note these, these are presented to you in ratio. If I actually plotted the, these luminosities, it would just be a curve that went down over 10 orders of magnitude. Right? To show the differences, this is all done in ratio to the HERA PDF. The scale of it, right, we do it as a function of the invariant mass in the subprocess. So QQ bar is creating something with the um, center of mass MX here, right? And so you can see that whereas the partons, I mean, they do, of course, overlap rather nicely. And when you consider that this is actually a curve over 10 orders of magnitude, the fact that they agree with each other around about the 5% level is not bad, frankly. But it also is not perfect. And one thing to note is we know it best in this kind of middling region. This is where we produce the Ws and the Zs and the Higgs. We know it pretty well there, right? We don't know it so well when you get up to higher scale. And higher scale is where you would be producing the new physics, right? Something really new would be up there in the TV regions. And we don't really know the parton parton luminosities so well. We also don't know them all that well as we go to lower scale or low x values, right? And that's another story that I might get time to come to before the end of the day. Now, why in fact do different people's part on distribution sets differ, right? Well, people actually differ even at the level of the data sets they include in order to do this, right? They differ in the cuts that they decide are necessary to apply in order to remain in the perturbative region. They differ in these forms of parameterization at the starting scale and indeed at the values of the starting scale. They differ as to their assumptions on the flavor structure of the C and, I'll, and of the valence. I'll come to that. And 
they also can choose different heavy flavor schemes for how to do the calculation. It's not actually completely trivial what you choose because you can choose what are called fixed flavor number schemes where you assume there are only ever actually three flavors in your proton, the U, the D, and the S, and everything else is perturbatively generated. This gives you problems with logs of Q squareds over the mass of your heavy quark charge squareds. Or you can do a variable flavor number scheme where once you've got enough energy to get a charm, you kind of assume that that charm is then part of your proton. Right? This is what most people, in fact, do. And again, you do the same with the beauty when you've got above the beauty thresholds. You kind of absorb them into your definition of what a proton is. And details like this can actually matter when it comes to the percent level precision we'd like to have in the end. Right? Um, and the other th last thing they differ on is what value of alpha s do they actually assume you need to use? Because alpha s, again, is not known perfectly by God. It has to be measured, right? We think it's around about 0.118 plus minus 0.001, roughly speaking, but we don't know what it is exactly. Um, so, OK. Now, I've put up this kinematic plane just to say that in recent years, we've gone beyond the HERA data, that's the orange stuff here, and the older data that came before HERA. And we've actually started to use data from the collider itself to try to determine the partons. Now, of course, you do that only with well-known processes that you think will be described by the standard model, right? You're not about, you don't want to fit away your new physics by putting in high-scale cross-sections into the fit. So we use things like Drell-Yan processes, that's just QQ bar to lepton plus lepton minus, if you don't know the terminology, WZ production, jet PT spectra, but not at too high a scale, otherwise you're in danger of fitting away your new physics. Right? And also now things like Ws and Zs with jets and heavy flavors, and that has extended the kinematic region that we fit quite considerably. Pardon? You're not really meant to be trying to read the scale, but just the, the kinematic range into the collider region here and the fact that very much more data is in there. The, anyway. Um, OK. Now, I'm not going to go into this piece that I've put here at any great length, because it's almost a complete lecture series in itself. But it is, how do PDFs actually evaluate their uncertainties, right? Not everybody just fits everything with a delta chi squared equals one and then you're done, right? Your problem really is there, are, there can be discrepancies between data sets. I'll, I'll just try and illustrate the problem and what the solution is, right? What if your overall fit determined you a parameter nicely like this? Say this is alpha s and your overall fit does this, right? But you have in it many different data sets. And, you know, this one's like this. This one's like that over here. This one's maybe a bit flat. That one's going the other way. Well, and so on, right? They don't Or if you took this rigid value, you would find that some of your data sets are not even fitted within their own 90% confidence excursions, that you're, by combining everything together, you're actually not doing what a particular data set would most like. So the solution is that they inflate the chi-squared tolerances just somewhat in order that this band will cover what every individual data set can tolerate right, at 90% confidence. So inflated chi-squared tolerances these days actually are only around about three, so delta chi-squared of 10. Historically, this had even gone up to as much as 100, which is, a, you know, you then begin to wonder about the statistical justification of any of it when it gets up to that level. OK, now, um, just for amusement, let's then go back and look at some of the things that you know, how we built up our knowledge historically. 
If you look at the ratio of the F2 structure function in neutrons and protons, these are the measurements from older experiments like NMC, Fermilab E665, and so on. If you try and work out what should be in there, just make the overall assumption that all of, all of the C is the same. So you've got, for the neutrons, U valence and 4 times D valence plus 4 thirds of the C. And for the protons, 4 U valence plus D valence, 4 thirds of the C. Right? You could work that out yourself. If you took the equations I wrote in lecture one and just plugged it in, you could work this ratio out. The measurements seem to tell us that as we go into low x, you've got, this is coming towards unity. Not perfectly, but in the ballpark of unity. Unity means, therefore, you would have no valence quark there and all C. So it is, helps you to establish that there are no valence quarks at small x. Now look at the other end. If we take it up to 1 and the C goes away, then if you actually believe that you, there's two U valence and one D valence and you plug that in with no C, you would get two-thirds for this ratio. But it doesn't go to two-thirds, does it? Look at it here. Right? It's way below two-thirds. In fact, it seems to be heading for about a quarter, perhaps. Right? A quarter would be where, what you would get if there was no D valence quark at all. Right? So what this is saying is it may well be true that there are two U valences to one D valence overall, integrated over all X, but it's not true as a function of momentum. So if you actually look at the D over U ratio as a function of X, you'll see that it falls steeply. There's still quite an error bar up at X of 1, so we don't know if it's falling to a quarter or to zero or any other value. Right? And that's today, in 2019. These are the best measurements that we have of this ratio. We don't really know what happens. But what we can say is that you mustn't make naive assumptions that the D and the U have the same shape. Another amusing thing, now there's flavor structure in the C. Now, if you were to take the difference between F2 proton and F2 neutron, Again, going back to lecture one, you could do this yourself. You would find that it's a third of U valence minus D valence plus two thirds U bar minus D bar. Right? If you assume U bar equals D bar then in the C, which is a very reasonable assumption, but if you assumed it, then that integral, it's called the Gottfried sum rule, it should be 0.33. But it was measured as more like 0.23 with a tighter error than will allow you to have 0.33. This therefore suggests that U bar and D bar are not equal. Indeed, because it's a lower value, it suggests D bar is bigger than U bar. Why on earth would that be? Right? And it, it has to be a non-perturbative effect of some kind. And I mean, just again to uh, try and suggest what might happen, right? you could have a proton, right? that some of the time, right, this is a, a non-perturbative kind of nuclear scale, might have, you know, dissociated itself into an n pi plus. What's a pi plus? It's got u d bar in it, right? Now, you say, OK, fine, but surely we can do the other thing and have it dissociate into something with a pi minus to equalize this out. But you've got to conserve charge. So what's going to go with your pi minus is not a nucleon with a similar mass. It would be a delta double plus with a considerably higher mass. So therefore, this does not happen as often as that happens. So extra d bar does not, you know, happens more than extra u bar. Right? Do nucleons really do this? I believe my nuclear physics friends tell me that they do. They do spend parts of their time, you know dissociated into pions. So the thing is, we've, you know, we're starting at low scales. We have initial conditions. And sometimes non-perturbative effects come in at the beginning, although they're then washed out by QCD. Now, this, therefore, is a measure of how big is the difference d bar minus u bar as a function of x. It's actually quite tiny, but certainly non-zero. Now, if you look at all the partons together here, there we've got the U valence, D valence, gluon, and the various flavors of the 
quarks, right? Then you can see here in the green, if you look carefully, the green is the D bar, the dark blue is the U bar, this tiny difference there, this difference translated here. And then if you go right up to collider scales, well, you'll be hard put to see it, to be honest. But it's there. It matters at the precision level. OK, now, there's the strange C. A first guess was let's just, you know, try an average between the U bar and the D bar C. But that's actually not the case, right? It's not just a simple average of U bar and D bar. And how do we know that? We know it because sometimes when you do neutrino scattering, so neutrino in, mu minus out, you've hit a strange quark and out will come a charm. And the charm can then decay semi-leptonically again. And when it does so, it will go to a mu plus. Right? It will create, therefore, an opposite sign, dimuon. Right? And that's your experimental signal, a mu plus and a mu minus. Right? And you can tell, therefore, how much of the st a strangeness there actually is. And certainly our early impressions were that there was only about half the amount of strangeness that there is of the U and the D. And that even seemed quite reasonable because, well, you kind of expect, since it has a larger mass, that it might be a bit suppressed. It's quite reasonable, right? But let's look at today's PDFs, right? This is the D bar, and this is the S bar. Now, if I look at them across x, I can see here at highish x, 10 to the minus 1, it is indeed suppressed, right? You take that across there, suppressed by about half, right? Is it still suppressed down at low x? Well, not necessarily. In fact, the problem is it's not really all that well known at all, right? <coughs> But to just make an, an assumption that it's suppressed at all values would not be correct. And it's modern data on W and Z production at the LHC that suggests, in fact, that it's not suppressed at low x. Because when you're making the Z, there's a surprising amount of contribution from the strange anti-strange in the Z. OK. One could even ask, is strangeness even charge symmetric? Right? Like, is S equal to S bar? Well, there's the MRST's S minus S bar. You can see how tiny it is and how uncertain. This is the CTEC evaluation of the same problem. They actually came up with the idea that within uncertainties, it could be zero. It's allowed a, you know, a fair range. Why would S not be equal to S bar? Well, again, I think we'd have to start thinking about you know, how these things might split into things like um, lambdas and k pluses. And you'll find there that whether you can split into something that's got an s bar is more likely than splitting into something that's got an s. It's the same kind of argument. OK. And the last thing in this sort of, this is a sort of tale of caution of things that, you know, work reasonably well, but let's not believe them 100%, right? Is it really true that U in the proton is D in the neutron and vice versa? Well, it can't be ultimately, can it? Because even if it is a U in the neutron, which might look a bit like a D in the proton, it's still a U quark, and it's still got charge two thirds, not minus a third. So when it starts doing QED radiation, as they all do, right? That's going to be different than a real D if what you've got is a U. So if you, in fact, have to take into account electroweak corrections to your partons, you're going to find these tiny differences between Ds in the proton and Us in the neutron and vice versa. They're certainly tiny, but they're there. Again, if you want real precision, you have to take it into account. So I'll now spend uh, just a few minutes on alpha S itself, right? Alpha S is one of the parameters of this fit. It's usually put in fixed. But as I told you, people who make PDFs differ as to what value of alpha S they like. Right. Now, many of the groups like values around 0.118. These values for each of these different PDFs here right, are 
determined by their own fits to the data and have certain errors for that region. Right? But there is one group that, in fact, whose fits consistently come out much lower at 0.1135, right? the ABM group. Now, the cross-section for something like, say, TT bar depends on alpha S quite strongly. What this actually is is a plot of the TT bar cross-section against alpha S. And you can see the measurement of alpha S of the ABM group here, right? how it would scale with alpha s. And the other groups are also on their own scaling lines. What is the TT bar cross-section? Because we've measured it, of course. It's this blue band here. So it certainly looks as if you know, this is a more reasonable value. Right? The same thing applies when we get the gluon gluon to the Higgs, the dominant contribution to the Higgs cross-section, is also highly alpha s dependent. And I mean, when you're dealing with the Higgs, one of the questions we're always asking ourselves now is, is this a standard model Higgs we've got? We've clearly found something. So far, all its properties are very standard model-like, the way it decays into all different channels that we can so far measure. It's doing it in a standard model-like manner. Right? The cross-section itself, right, is that standard model-ish? Well, in fact, it depends what value of alpha s you put in. So I think it would be reasonable, given the, va the fact that these guys got it right for the top, to assume that these guys are more likely to have it right for what the standard model Higgs cross-section is. But what I'm just trying to say mostly is that actually what the standard model says is not completely determined. And there are outliers of people who you know, believe it says something slightly lower than the rest. And that would mean that the actual measurements that we've got of it are further away from the standard model than you might think they are. So that's just a cautionary tale. So um, kind of winding up this lecture, what is the consequence in a PDF fit of fixing alpha s or not fixing it? Right? So this is the same PDF fit I just showed you, right? with a fixed value of alpha s at 0.118. Now, go over here, and we free the value of alpha s. What difference has it made? You can see it very clearly. It makes no difference to the u and the d valence quarks, pretty well no difference to the c. But it makes quite a lot of difference to the gluon. It widens out its error bar considerably. And why would that be? Because alpha s and the gluon are intimately tied to each other. Right? The gluon is coming from radiation. The rate of the radiation depends on alpha s. So how much gluon we've got is correlated to what the value of alpha s is and is giving us this rather you know, more substantial error on the low x gluon. Now, what can you do about that? You can, of course, just say, well, I will believe the PDG value and its bounds, and I will only use it within those bounds. But if you look at the PDG value again, um, in some ways, it's a bit like this. It's a compromise from many different data sets, which actually said something slightly different. Right? So we're not in a position to say, you know, this is wrong or that's wrong and so on, and the value truly is. We just have to go with the compromise. But you are allowed to doubt it at some level, right? And in particular, what would be a good idea is to try to determine alpha s from within the same data set. Right? So this is clearly, you know, the value of alpha s there is allowing quite a, a slop on the gluon. How can we get rid of that within the same data set, right? What you do is you use the JET data. Now, I told you before about the two processes, the QCD Compton and the boson gluon fusion process, right, which contribute to the scaling violation. But in fact, you can actually really see events like this, because these will produce events with two clear JETs and a general jet going down the proton remnant direction. You can see that it's basically going down the beam line. So what you're looking for is two extra jets. Now, you can't, on an event-by-event -event basis, tell whether it's coming from boson gluon fusion or QCD Compton. But you've got these two contributions to your cross-section 
one dominantly from the glue and one dominantly from quarks. And this helps us to break the very strong correlation between the value of alpha s and the gluon shape by giving us more information directly on the gluon if we measure these two jet events. Right? So if you're interested in the gluon, only, you assume you know alpha s and choose a kinematic region where this process dominates, like at low x. Or if you're interested in alpha s, you choose a kinematic region where you think the PDFs are reasonably well known, right, at higher x. But in practice, what we'll really do is fit everything all at once to try and get some extra information about the glue. And this is a technique, right? I'm d using it here just with deep inelastic scattering here at jets, but this has been used with all the jets from the colliders as a way of determining alpha s, as a way of sharpening up your gluon. Right? So I think the final slide before the break is to say, here I was with my free alpha s fit to my deep inelastic scattering data, and then I put in the DIGET data from those events, and that gave me a much tighter handle on the gluon. If you just flip back two slides, you can see it's not quite as tight as that, but it's getting much better, right, when you add extra information. And also, in fact, the determination of alpha s from the deep elastic scattering data alone Right, inclusive data, had a very shallow, shallow parabola. If you put in the jets, you've got a much tighter chi-squared parabola and a much better determination of what alpha s is. This is 1183. The experimental error is only, well, nearly 001. And we also accounted for those model and parameterization and hadronization errors. So I think that's it. And it's 10 to 11, so it's time for our break. Right. Um, I don't know. You first. Uh, so how big are the backgrounds due to, uh, <coughs> due to these PDFs uh, on the LHC experiments in comparison with other, other big backgrounds? Actually, that's almost the topic of the, the public lecture that I'm giving later this afternoon, is to actually take this to the LHC processes and say, how much does it really matter for what we're doing now? That's exactly what I'm going to talk about. So. Yes. Uh, because uh, the mass of delta plus plus is uh, higher than. Uh, yes. So this completely explains the. It actually it doesn't completely explain it. It points in the right direction for for the effect. I mean, right now today, this is the kind of thing that nuclear physicists worry about and try to calculate. And I don't believe there is a unique, exact explanation for this. I was just trying to give you an idea of what kind of things might happen. But no, that certainly doesn't completely explain it, that there are other considerations right? beyond the scope of what I'm trying to talk about today. So.